Up next, we're going to hear from the one federal agency whose core mission statement includes protecting human health and the environment, the Environmental Protection Agency. One of their top priorities that affects us all is improving air quality. Here to share their latest work, please welcome Liz Ness, Jason Smith, and Halil Chakir. Thank you, James. The average person takes between 17 and 20,000 breaths per day. Each one is an opportunity to put pollutants in your lungs and body and to increase health risks if you're exposed to air pollution. Now, before we get into that, let's pause for a moment to connect with the simple act of breathing. Please join me in taking a deep breath. Feel the air filling your lungs and slowly breathe out. Now, imagine you're in Donora, Pennsylvania in 1948. Donora is situated in the Monongahela River Valley, where a steel mill and a zinc plant were operating when a temperature inversion trapped the air in the valley for five days. That trapped air became a toxic mix of pollutants, and over those five days, nearly half the town's 14,000 residents experienced severe respiratory and cardiovascular problems, and the death toll rose to 20. Sonora was not the only place across the country experiencing extreme air quality events in the middle of the last century. Such events led to the formation of the Environmental Protection Agency in 1970. EPA works closely with its state partners to collect ambient air data from over 4,000 monitors across the country. These data are the backbone to our regulatory decisions, and we have made great progress improving air quality over the last 50 years. But there is still work to do. Recently, even right here in Washington, D.C., the headlines were about air quality concerns. In addition to the regulatory requirements that comprise the bulk of EPA's work, we want to empower citizens to make their own decisions about their exposure to air pollution. We have monitors across the country to support the needs of our regulatory programs. But we want to be able to provide data to people even when they're not monitors in their immediate vicinity. Let's focus on particulate matter. We do this by taking data from these monitors and interpolating them to create surfaces for the whole country. And this has been a great approach. But we run into issues when we have areas of the country without monitors. For example, we have multiple monitors in Kansas City and in St. Louis. The interpolation provides an air quality surface communicating that Jefferson City and Columbia have moderate air quality. We have to ask ourselves, how accurate is this? What if we could improve those air quality surfaces with more data, such as meteorology, terrain, major roadways? This is the mission for our team. My colleagues, Halil and Jason, are going to show you the work that we've been doing to improve the science behind our communication to the public. Air quality stations are generally clustered in highly populated areas which is not optimal to create the best air quality surface. Let's start our analysis by moving away from air quality index categories to raw particulate matter values, and then consider additional data sources. Emissions from motor vehicle exhaust and gasoline vapors are one of the major sources of atmospheric pollution. Thus, road network density could be a good proxy for air pollution emission estimates. Terrain can affect atmospheric processes, such as changes in temperature and surface wind patterns, affecting transport, transformation, and removal of atmospheric pollutants and particulate matter. Collaborating with our NOAA partners allows us to integrate CMAC, which provides meteorological inputs, man-made and naturally occurring emissions, and the fate and transport of pollutants. We want to incorporate all this information into a single model that can predict across the country accurately. We will use empirical Bayesian Kriging regression prediction, a geostatistical interpolation method that combines 
Kriegen with, uh, Kriegen with regression analysis to make predictions that are more accurate than either Kriegen or regression can achieve on their own. This will take roughly three minutes. Let's fast forward to see the results. This is the output of the tool. And these are the predicted air quality values for our region. To explore how this model is improving our analysis, a few visual examples can demonstrate how all the factors were incorporated into the model. This is the San Joaquin Valley, where the terrain plays an important role in the accumulation of particulate matter. The valley's topography and the surrounding mountains form the perfect conditions to trap air pollutants. If you live in Fresno, California, let's see the air you breathe comes from. These spaghetti lines describe the trajectories, the position, and dispersion of air pollution. Air comes through the San Francisco Bay Area, picking up pollution, moving down the valley, and into your lungs in Fresno. Another example of the benefit of this approach can be seen when we navigate back to Columbia, Missouri. There are no monitors in Columbia. A simple interpolation method would average the values from Kansas City and San Luis. But as you can see, the output shows slight uptick in Columbia, even though there are no monitors. This is likely due to emissions and metrology now being incorporated into the model. Up to this point, the air quality surface is the result of using smart defaults for model parameters. But strong scientific practice requires that we dig deeper into the parameters and diagnostics, like the semi-variogram type and the root mean square error. The geostatistical wizard provides the interface to do just that. We can change the parameters, use the map and the semi-variogram to further tune our model. Once we are satisfied with few changes, the cross-validation section let us review the diagnostics, which can help us to document and defend our model. Feeling comfortable with our final model, the information is now ready for the public consumption. So how does the EPA translate this science into something more accessible for the general public? How can we more quickly get it into the hands of those who need it so they can make the most informed decision? To help Halil with his analysis, he applied a color scheme that allowed us to see small changes in air pollution. EPA has a standardized color scheme for pollutants that are associated with health effects you may experience when exposed to air pollution. Before we can share this data with the public, we need to translate the values from Halil's analysis into EPA's Air Quality Index, or AQI, color scheme. Later this year, the EPA will be unveiling a new AirNow website. Let me show you how it can make a difference in your lives. Let's say my sister is a jogger and she'd like to go for a run and she just simply wants to know what current air quality conditions are like. She can quickly get that answer right from her mobile phone by looking at this beautifully designed air quality dial. Let's say my brother, on the other hand, wants to take a deeper dive into the science behind the work that we do. He can use our new interactive map of air quality to turn on ambient air monitors and see what's been happening at a local site over the past 12 hours. While doing this, he may notice that air quality is not constant, but changing throughout the day, often in recurring patterns. He may also notice on a national scale that other patterns emerge when looking at air quality as well. My dad, on the other hand, may think back to that asthma attack he had last summer 
and may want to explore whether air quality might have played a role in triggering it using our AirNow archives. These are just three examples of the new capabilities that will be coming with the new AirNow website in the future. We can take advantage of these technologies and incorporate them into programs geared towards specific communities. One of my favorite programs at EPA is the Air Quality Flags program. This program allows schools and organizations to sign up and use brightly colored flags corresponding to EPA's AQI colors to inform parents, children, and the community about their local air quality conditions. These flags are updated daily and allow the community to adjust their activities to reduce their exposure to air pollution. This is also a great example of engaging communities across the country. This is a powerful resource to me as a mother of two active boys, and it's exciting to be able to engage them in decisions that affect their health. We've enjoyed sharing our innovation and progress with you. How air quality plays a role in your life, and how scientific rigor and complex analyses are the foundation for the air quality data that EPA shares with you. Thank you. Thanks, EPA team. You can bet I'll be checking the AirNow app before planning my next family hike.